serving at St. John, I served as pastor at University Lutheran Church in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is how I met the acquaintance of Professor Helmut Kester. Um, on the Sunday that I preached, uh, University Lutheran uh, maintains a custom of inviting candidates for its pastorate to preach in the congregation prior to a congregational meeting. And so I came to, to preach as a candidate. And um, there were two services on the Sunday that I preached. In, the, uh, in one service, um, seated in front of me in the first row, um, was a man whose articles and books on the New Testament I had read, a guy named Helmut Kester. I had never heard him speak before I had never seen him um, but I had been clued in by one of the uh, members of the call committee that he was sitting there in the front pew um, so um, after the service um, and in the second service an another guy a guy named Christer Stendhal who, who was another New Testament scholar sat also in the front pew that was at the second service and both of them sat together, as I recall, between the services at a question and answer period. Um, but after I preached at that first service, um, Kester shook my hand at the door, the usual way of, of exiting, and looked at me and said, Pastor Larson, my name is Helmut Kester. I teach New Testament at Harvard Divinity School and I will tell you when you get your exegesis wrong. <laughs> and gosh, he did. So <laughs> preaching here was easy. Helmut <laughs> Kester has taught New Testament uh, at Harvard Divinity School since 1958. He has contributed articles uh, to a wide series of journals in the field. And in the work that he's done, the, the, the distinguishing aspect of his work is that he took the work of his mentors and teachers, focused very much on the textual context of early Christianity, what could be understood of early Christianity and its flowering in the first centuries based on texts. Kester took their work, learned from it, and then expanded that work by setting it also in the material context of antiquity. A material context that includes the study of numismatics, coins, uh, the study of Greek and Roman engineering in its complexities, the study of art, statuary, um, dealing with customs such as uh, epitaphs and epigrams and their import in understanding context. Um, Professor Kester's work has aided and abetted the understanding and the interpretation of the New Testament greatly by contributing to its understanding as a movement that was very much rooted in an announcement of God's justice, an announcement made known in Jesus Christ and witnessed to in a Hellenistic Roman context which struggled around those issues. So it's great to have you here. Thanks. Well, thank you, Don. Uh, it was indeed a pleasure during those years that uh, Don Larson was at the University of the Church to listen to sermons by uh, a scholar pastor quite a bit of knowledge of the New Testament itself, and its scholarly interpretation, not its pious interpretation. Um, so it led to a, we hope, lasting friendship. Um, 
Well, how many of you have been to the Holy Land? Um, my interest in dealing with the archaeological materials, coins, inscriptions, architecture, um, pottery, whatever, um, was not concentrated on the Holy Land. Intentionally not, but concentrated on the areas of Greece, Macedonia, Western Asia Minor, which is now Western Turkey. Why? Because these are the formative places in which Christianity, as we know it, was formed. Um, it is here that Pauline mission, really for the first time, developed the concept of a new people of God, the ecclesia, the, which is our term, church, uh, the new Israel. Uh, all this is developed in the Greek world, and it's developed in the most flourishing, uh, intellectually and economically flourishing area uh, of the Roman Empire at the time, namely in Athens and Corinth, and, uh, Thessaloniki and, and, and Ephesus, Pergamon, blessed places you will visit in, in Turkey. Uh, these were the heartland of Christianity and they were at the same time the countries in which the um, intellectual and economic activities of the Roman Empire were the center, the center of the Roman world was indeed the area from Ephesus to Thessaloniki, um, to Corinth, Athens, Athens marginally so. It's also interesting that Paul's mission was concentrated on the uh, capitals. Um, Ephesus is the capital of the province of Asia. Thessaloniki is the capital of the province of Macedonia and uh, Corinth at the time was the capital of the province of Greece, Achaia, of course. Um, so Paul is going right into the center of a world that is absolutely different from the world of Jesus and Palestine. Um, it's a different language, it's a different culture, um, it's different heritage, and uh, particularly also very different in terms of its economic uh, context. Um, so, in distinction to what you would, might want to do when you travel to the Holy Land where you want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, uh, who spoke and preached and are made, uh, in mostly rural, small town and village culture of Galilee. Um, now the transfer of the Christian message into, which really formed what we know as Christianity until today, um, was a, a Greek speaking, highly developed economically um, the area with um, capitals of provinces that were uh, indeed very successful in terms of the economic um, trade, um, industrial production. So if you really want to know um, what is the cultural context of early Christianity, is this still on? You have to regulate it back then. Um, you have to go to the places, some of the places you will visit during your trip to, uh, to Turkey later this year. Um, and it is a world that's far away from the world of Jesus. Um, the difference could not be more striking because Galilee certainly was a bad country. Jerusalem had an important temple and had a, a very wealthy bank and 
temple ban banquet. Um, the, Herod the Great had made an effort to make this a leading, also economically leading city. And um, when you look at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, that's um, superb Herodian architecture, uh, which shows an, an influx of the Eastern Greek world uh, into Jerusalem. But that was not the home of Jesus and his preaching. Jesus and his preaching belonged into Galilee, where apparently most of his activity was. Now, one thing that is very important for your understanding of what you are doing, you are not going into the footsteps of Paul or any other Christian missionary. You are not following sort of a kind of holy pilgrimage. Paul was here, and now we are going down the same road that Paul uh, went down. We don't know that. Um, I once had to do this. It was it was uh, not 2008 to the so-called um, 2000th birthday of Paul, um, the ecumenical. Patriarch Bartholomew, uh, who resides in, in, in Istanbul, but of course, in the terms of the Greek church, is not called Istanbul, but it's still called Constantinople, um, invited um, all archbishops and patriarchs of the Greek Orthodox Church for a one week conference in beginning in Istanbul and uh, following in a pilgrimage to Ephesus and uh, then to uh, 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 Pergi in the, in the south near Antalya, where she will also visit. Um, there I indeed was the leader of a pilgrimage in the footsteps of Paul. Um, because most of those archbishops and patriarchs uh, had never really studied the context of false ministry could have been. All they had, of course, was, I guess, they knew the birth year of Paul, because they must have somewhere in the archives the birth certificate of Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, it was, they, they knew it was 2008. Um, but um, that was a very different kind of tour and um, a strange experience with about 80 um, black um, garmented um, archbishops and bishops and um, whatever in uh, following me and stopping here and there and I had a Greek translator on one side and I had a Russian translator on the other side, um, and uh, moving slowly uh, to, the, to Ephesus and later to through Puri, where it was incidentally raining, um, and the uh, ecumenical patriarch was uh, shielded by a wonderful umbrella, um, wanted to hear exactly what I was saying, so. He called me to his side, and I always had to speak loud enough into the rainy city in order to uh, tell the people what they really saw. Uh, no, we are not. You are not going in the footsteps of Paul. What are you doing? You are doing something that is extremely important. You learn more about the history and culture and religions of the age of early Christianity. So, yeah, what is important too, exactly at this point, um, when you go through an ancient city like Ephesus or Pergamon, you have a very 
wide, uh, a, a very wide circle of, of things you are looking at. Um, even if you can imagine the ruins that you see, what they looked like originally, it doesn't mean that that was really what Paul saw, or where Paul was. Um, if you go, you would be in Ephesus and you would see the Library of Celsus, reconstructed by the Austrian um, Archaeological Institute. Very impressive monument. Um, the, it wasn't there when Paul was there. And what you have to learn is the, the big distances in terms of time from, from the very time um, before the mission of Paul and a century or centuries thereafter to the building of the first Christian, surviving Christian churches. Um, this is a period of, of building activities um, very impressive that goes from the classical period of Greece um, that is 500, 400 before the common era to the building that was going on and the relocation of Ephesus uh, when it was moved to a new position closer to the, to the, to the harbor um, that um, you, what you see is things being excavated which have been built during a period of 300, 400, 500 years right next to each other. Um, so what you see now in terms of reconstructed buildings and what you see in terms of the um, ruins, you don't forget that you're talking about um, activities in city building. City building that covers a period that is much longer than the existence of the United States of America. 400, 500 years, um, a Roman forum built in the 5th century, um, something wrong, oops, no other disaster coming up. <laughs> Also, um, and you will get this in a handout that you will take along to, to your travel. You have to learn what periods are you in. And for those of you who have been in the Holy Land or read something about it, the periods are designated in a very different way. Um, let me give you an example and I have uh, in a handout that I have prepared, prepared that Don can use uh, for a new handout that we go to you. Um, a uh, comparative chronological table. Now, if you talk about in the Greek world, the archaic period, we are talking about the 9th, 10th, 9th, 8th century. It's called in the, in the world of uh, Israel, um, not archaic period, but the Iron Age period. And the Iron Age is, of course, the great period of Israel. That's the, that's the period that reaches from David and uh, Solomon. Uh, to the time of the Greek conquest uh, by the two Alexander the Great. This is Iron Age. Um, it 
presumably was a very important formative period for Israel, but at the same time, um, it was a dark period in Greece and Israel. We know very little about it. There's very little building activity. It starts in the classical period, and the classical period in Israel is not called the classical period, but the late period of, uh, of Israel's history, uh, where uh, the um, decline um, of, of Israel takes place after, after the exile. So it's the post-exilic period which we, um, which we talk about. Um, so I don't want to go in more detail, um, but you have to learn very quickly, and I think God will help you and others, um, what the building materials are. Um, you have in the Greek, classical Greek period, the building materials are usually dressed stone. Um, of beautifully dressed stones. Marble, if it was available, and Greece has some marble, and Turkey has an enormous amount of marble available. Um, you see the stone as it was visible in antiquity, a wall as it was visible in antiquity. Maybe the only difference that there may have been some paintings on the wall. Um, Temple columns of temples uh, are marble uh, column drums, um, which you see the marble itself again painted, which the painters disappear today. So you will recognize immediately, ah, this must be classical and Hellenistic period. Then you move into the Roman period and buildings from the Roman period, and that's essentially the period of early Christianity, Roman imperial period. Um, they you see very ugly walls of either uh, field stone or uh, brick, um, which you see, this is not what's happening here. Why is that? Do they have these rough? Walls. Well, um, they didn't have them. You didn't see them in antiquity. What you saw was rough brick walls, which were uh, <coughs> either dressed with uh, uh, or, or were, um, uh, were hidden behind uh, marble plates, which have disintegrated by now. So you have the a bare wall there. But uh, one thing to do very quickly is to uh, learn to recognize a little bit when was this built. And once you get a little development, a good eye for it, you might be able to go, oh, this must be Roman because it, it's brick. Uh, and brick didn't look good because it was all refetted with marble. of wonderful marble plates of what today only a few remnants of us are still surviving. So try to distinguish a little bit when you go through. And uh, the Greeks, of course, at the same time, tried to build their way, um, even in the Roman Imperial period, um, built and rebuilt. So the Artemis Temple in Ephesus, of which very little is left today, was still rebuilt at the beginning of the Hellenistic period, that is about 300, uh, in, in white marble columns. Um, one column survives of about 120 that were there originally. Um, but you go through these places these archaeological sites and try to discern, try to distinguish. And 
have the courage to say, I think this must be Roman because it's a brick wall and there's a little bit of the marble or that went left at the bottom. Um, so typically Roman building next to another building that is built out of the Roman period, but according to Greek styles, and the Greek styles of building continue uh, where the beauty lies in the, uh, in the constructions. The constructions are visible and they are beautiful, where this in the Roman building, the construct, the, the important parts of the building normally made in bricks. And when Paul was there, he couldn't see any bricks because it was all revetted with beautiful marble. And sometimes as thin as a quarter of an inch. Uh, they had uh, watched this, watched for, for the marble revetments. Even later, we will see some of them in, uh, in Istanbul. Istanbul, that is Constantinople in antiquity, preserves very little from the uh, early Christian period. It was, but just in Constantinople was only built in the early 4th century, common era. Um, but it's built as a Roman building and uh, it has everywhere still often preserved these beautiful marble revetment plates, large plates which have been cut very thinly. It's amazing. I've always marveled at those. Uh, Marvel at the marvels. <laughs> okay, so, but uh, the important thing that you sh should do when you go through is not to say what was the religion that was pushed to. Yes, you should. You should ask what was really the Artemis of the Ephesus. Great as the Ephesian Artemis, which appears in the Book of Acts, Paul's visit in Ephesus. Um, but this uh, I, I, I got distracted by something I wanted to say. Um, yeah. What was the significance of this temple? The temple that to Artemis that stood there. Um, originally the temple to a goddess archaic goddess of the Greek, pre-Greek period even, um, but built and rebuilt, destroyed in a great fire at the end of the fourth century. Um, in the night, it is said, in which Alexander the Great was born, and um, rebuilt again in its classical Greek style in every respect, with its 120 columns double colonnades on all sides. Um, impressive. What was going on there? Very little. You know, this is interesting, you know. The, 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 these temples are the houses of the gods. In contrast to what the Christians built, houses for people. Um, what, how did people relate to it? Well, in two ways. There were some regular sacrifices which took place outside of the temple. Um, the altars are always outside of the temple building itself. Um, the kind of stuff that you burnt there for the gods, the almost bad stuff from a slaughtered animal that are not fit to eat and so you burn it. So the gods would smell the uh, beauty. Um, but the main activity was one week uh, every year in which the uh, birthday of Artemis was celebrated. And that was procession. Well, that was the sacrifice that the 
Chitani on that is the seat of the city government uh, in which the Chitanis, the highest official, had to, sacri had to sacrifice one animal every day out of his or her own pocket. And that's why they served only for one year. <laughs> because they were probably broken and it was all over. Um, and um, the, look at the inscriptions there, which are every Britannus, every um, city director, so to say, uh, left, and there were he's and she's, there were also women who had this uh, office. Um, they left an inscription in which they listed how many cult officials, how many flutists and how many dancers and so on. Um, Don will not forget to show them these inscriptions to you. Um, and um, also, we we'll also remember that. Um, so the inscriptions tell us a little bit about the rise and fall of the popularity of the religion. How many flutists, how many dancers were employed. Um, and it's a very interesting study because you can follow this over uh, several, many generations for about 300 years. Um, in, in the counting of the activities um, of, of the temple. Okay, I promised Don I don't even talk about her. <laughs> and I have been able to, I have been talking too much already. I think it would be much better if we opened it up to any questions that you might have. And that might be useful for a better understanding of what you will see and visit. So, can we throw this open to um, comments and questions that you have, please? Yes? You were talking about the sacrifices that were offered. Can you explain briefly what, what the role of sacrifice was in Greek and Roman times? Why, why they believed that the gods would like it if they killed animals or gave something up? Yeah. But the history of sacrifices is a very old one and originally probably has to do um, with, the, uh, with the question of um, what are we doing, we human beings, when we hunt animals in the wild and slaughter them and eat their meat? Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting question uh, that the sacrifices that uh, originally understood as a violation of uh, nature. Um, if you hunt animals and eat them, you violate the harmony of nature. And the gods who are responsible for the, uh, for the natural world have to be given their her share. Uh, that's probably the origin of sacrifice in the, in the Greek world. Um, it's a totally different story in Israel, um, of which we have documentation because we have the books of uh, Leviticus and the Bible and know, know about them. Um, but there is one underlying um, pattern that um, is probably that is shared by Israel as well as by the Greeks and the Romans, and that is to do something to please the gods, because for the well-being of the of a commonwealth, of a city, or of a country, the favor of the gods is extremely important. When the gods withdraw their favor, you're facing political and military and what not disasters. You probably, if you forget to sacrifice, you probably face a plague that will devastate, kill one third of the population. Um, the, 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 
controversies which, which arose very soon, at least in the, the year 100 between Roman Christianity and the Roman world, um, were mostly centered around the question, do all people serve the gods in order to please them? And um, you don't forget the sacrifice on any particular day because it might mean that the gods will withdraw their favors. Um, and the Christians said no. Um, the, so one of the great persecutions in the second century of Christianity um, appeared when the Roman army was defeated by the Parthians in the east and brought back the plague from Mesopotamia into the, in, into the Western world. And um, the question arose, why? Why have the gods withdrawn their favor? And the answer was, because of the Christians. They did not worship. They did not worship the gods uh, as they ought to. And uh, so there are mostly local phenomena uh, that people uh, had up to a third or more of the population dying by the plague. Uh, what terrible punishment have the gods brought about us? Well, they have brought this about us because we have not uh, followed their worship. Uh, John? So sacrifice plays a role in the stability of the political system, but it also plays a role in the stability of local community because right. a part of Israel's system of sacrifice did not permit people to eat of the sacrifice, but in Greek and Roman sacrifice, the community consumed meat from the sacrifice in communal activity in communal meals. Most, most of the meat that was consumed in antiquity uh, was meat from sacrificed animals. <laughs> but you didn't want to eat fat, skins, bones. That was burned on the altar, all the bad stuff. And the rest of the sacrificed animal went to the, the meat market. <laughs> And that is what Paul already discusses, whether one should eat, eat meat that comes from sacrifice to the idols. Um, and uh, because Christians know that there is nothing in the world that is not pure, that everything that is in the world is uh, provided by the God, by God or by the gods um, for the well-being of people. <coughs> But the meat you could eat, the percentage of meat that was eaten that is not from sacrifice was probably very, very small in antiquity. Um, yes? In your description, you, you talked about the Greeks as thinking of the gods as being quite active in determining the outcome of politics and military. Uh, campaigns and so on. So one, two points of comparison. One is, how did, how, perhaps how would Paul have thought about that? Would that have been you know, familiar to him or somewhat foreign? And then can you contrast that to the way, maybe a little bit, the way people think about that today? Uh, it depends on where you live. There are some places where people believe that God determines the outcome of every football game. There are other places where there are other places where people believe God is distant and is not involved in those sorts of mundane affairs, yeah. military, political, or sports. All the around good questions that you all know with this. Um, let, let me go a little back. Um, the, the religions of the ancient world. Those established, you have two types. You have those established uh, for, for centuries, local religions. Artemis of Ephesus, the most famous example. But you have also a new wave of religions like the Egyptian 
religion that was widespread at the time of early Christianity and probably during the second century its greatest rival was temples to Isis and Serapis, mm -hmm. the Egyptian God. Um, now what happens with the Pauline mission, and that's extremely important, is that Paul did not preach another one of those religions. Um, Paul did not preach a new religion at all. But Paul wanted to create a new society in which there was no Jew, no Greek, no free, no slave, no male and female. Society of justice and equality as an alternative to the Roman system. And Paul saw the Roman system as unjust because of its tremendous social injustices and inequalities. <coughs> this should not dominate the Christian world. Now there are changes after Paul uh, with respect to understanding Christianity more and more as another religion. Uh, but that's not the initial impetus. The initial uh, beginning of the Christian mission as we see it in the Pauline mission is building of churches, so of communities. And Paul takes the terminology uh, for designate these communities out of the political world, not out of the world of religion. That's very clear already in the term ecclesia, which we translate as church. Ecclesia is the traditional term for the assembly of people in the marketplace or in the theater. Um, the, the term gospel, evangelion, is a term that was used in the proclamations of emperors of the beginning of a new age. It's also a political term. Um, and it's striking that in the early Christian churches, the early Christian sources, the terms for, typical terms for religious association are missing. They don't exist. Um, and um, if you go back to Code to 1 Corinthians 11 and that question, you really need a whole course on that. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, but um, the founding, the founding of communities, in which, interestingly enough, um, it implies there is no Jew, no Greek. Um, now tell this to uh, Israel and the Palestinians. Um, that, that those distinctions no longer matter because you accept everybody with respect and with love. And um, whether you're a slave or whether you're a woman, it does not matter. Um, that is the new blueprint for the Christian community. Interestingly enough, you'll see that um, when Christianity finally succeeded, succeeded to be a legitimate, tolerated religion under Constantine, not the state religion or something like this, and took another hundred years. Um, the pagan temples mostly fell into ruins. Um, at most of the, the pagan temples to the pagan gods, or also to the Egyptian gods, or whatever, um, there is no evidence that the Christians willfully, willfully destroyed any of those. They were not the enemies of Christianity. But there is one type of temple which the, the Christians after Constantine uh, hacked to pieces, destroyed them completely. Not what kind of temples would the Christians destroy? Temples built to the imperial cult. 
Christ was king, not the emperor. And um, there are some interesting examples of um, huge and important um, templates for the imperial cult, for the cult of the emperor, which have been hacked to pieces. Um, but not pagan templates either fell into disuse or were taken over by Christian churches locally. Um, if you have a city, city government that is in its majority Christian, they will not vote any money to rebuild a temp temple that was destroyed by an earthquake because the majority city government would vote against it. Um, what then to do with that property? Oh, the property is wonderful. Why not change it into a Christian church? So we have a pagan temple, and you see examples. Pagan temple that has a row of colonnades outside, and then a cellar in the center with, with the statue of the deity, of the god or goddess. Um, the Christian said, why don't just take the foundations for the outside columns and make them into walls, take the columns and put them inside, so you have a three-eyed basilica. Um, watch out for this kind of thing. <laughs> Aphrodisias has a wonderful example. Um, Aphrodisias left the colon colonnades, the Temple of Aphrodite, they left the colonnades, outside colonnades, standing where they were, and used them as the dividing uh, colonnades between the central aisle and the side aisles. And then built outside of them um, a, a, a new, temp, new church walls. So you get a huge church built probably in the 5th century common era. And you'll see it in Aphrodisias. Um, Look at it carefully, you can see what happens, what the Christians did with this Aphrodite temple. Yes? Uh, magic uh, and sorcery seem to be important themes in, uh, in antiquity. Will we see any evidence of that? Yeah but probably only in museums. Yeah. <laughs> um, Maybe also in inscriptions? In inscriptions, yeah. in votive offerings. Yeah. Um, but um, not all is in, in, these things are not in inscriptions. Um, but there are collections with um, half a dozen or more folio volumes of the publication of Greek magical papyri that have survived, and also of, uh, of astrological papyri. Astrology also play a, played a very big role. Um, the basic underlying concept is this of the presence of evil demons was with belief that evil demons caused all the uh, trouble in the world. If demon, demons, disease is seen as demon possession. So you have to drive out demons, as Jesus did. Christians shared those beliefs. But um, the striking difference between Christian documents uh, of, of magic and the pagan is that the pagan documents are very, very complicated and often very difficult to read because they have all sorts of magic words in them and so 
where as Christian tells us, read the Gospels. Uh, Jesus does it quickly. He doesn't have a big ceremony calling about God to come down with all its powers, but Jesus has this power and he does it. Um, so, yes, Christians share, of course, magic. Beliefs that disease, human disease is caused by demons is widely believed. But the Christians exercise, exercise them. One, one piece of, so, so um, in terms of magic, mostly um, we won't see much of that except in museums because the evidence is textual. Um, yes. But we will see in one site that we visit something which is, it, to our way of thinking, oftentimes related to this, although it's distinct in a place called Didyma, um, yeah. we, we will encounter um, material evidence of uh, the role of the oracle at, uh, at the temple in Didyma. And so, um, and, and this, the role of this oracle is very similar to the role of the oracle of Delphi, Delphi. Um, and so, the role of an oracle is a little bit different, though, than the practice of magic. Um, oracular function often takes, um, it often has a political uh, role to play. Uh, when political leaders consulted oracles as to decisions, um, but also other people consulted oracles. Um, but, yeah, when we see I, I'm trying to remember if we'll see inscriptional, we may see some inscriptional evidence also that we can point out of things that oracles said. Yeah. Um, you want to talk to us about oracles a little bit? Well, yeah. Um, the, um, <coughs> the classical oracle, of course, is Delphi. In Greece, and it was consulted at the time, even though it's a Greek play, uh, Apollo Oracle. Apollo was primarily the god of oracles. Um, Delphi was consulted not just by Greeks, but also by others, um, non Greek people. Famous story of Croesus, uh, the last king of Sardis, um, when he was threatened by the Persian invading his his kingdom in Asia Minor. That's in Central Asia Minor. You you will be very quickly in Zalus, right? Yeah, too okay. quickly. So he said to the oracle in Delphi, it was a Greek oracle, but it was world famous, and um, so the conservation and, and that is the famous thing that already known in antiquity is the ambiguity of what the oracle said. Because uh, the oracle in Delphi answered the king uh, saying, if you, uh, if you go with your army beyond the Hades River, which was the eastern, eastern border of his kingdom, you will destroy a great kingdom. And of course he said, that's the Persian kingdom that I'll destroy him when the cross had invaded it. And of course he destroyed his own kingdom by doing so. And uh, the great persecution of Christianity which started in the year 303, common era, um, also was triggered by an oracle, that was the oracle of Didyma which you will visit a large oracle temple, a good hundred meters in length. It's a huge, kind of huge That oracle of Didyma was the most important oracle in the Roman period worldwide. Um, the inscriptions that come from uh, the 
tell us about the conservation of oracles um, from people as far came as far away as Great Britain to listen to what the oracle had to say. Uh, of course, we had to bring a lot of money to the big oracles. It was expensive. And um, this huge building project uh, of the temple in Dilema, uh, one of my most beloved places because it's so interesting. Um, they built on the project 600 years. From the time of Alexander the Great, who we issued the rebuilding that the Persians had destroyed um, all the time to the beginning of Christianity of Anna Constantine. Um, but the, the expenses of the building were enormous. You just see three columns still standing. It was planned of over a hundred columns, a double colonnade on all sides. Um, and um, inside the temple they have found uh, drawings in the, on the wall uh, for the shape of building materials, uh, whatever is needed, what to, can, can, one to one um, models painted there. And architects followed the model, the, these paintings, which probably were put there around the year 300 before the common era in the continuation of building more next year, another column, uh, one column with its capital and arbitrary, one of 105, I think it is, cost 10,000 man days. You can have some idea how expensive it was to build this. Never finished in 600 years. But functioning, and when <coughs> the Emperor Diocletian was in doubt what he should do with the increasing number of Christians, that was in the year 303 of the Common Era, he consulted the oracle in, in Dinima, and the oracle in Dinima but said, because of the many Christians in the world, the oracle was silent. And then the emperor decided to eradicate the Christians because he could not afford to have the most important, important oracle of the empire to be silent. That triggered the great persecution of Christianity which ended up, of course, in disaster and finally in the rise of Constantine. So, it's um, it, Delphi was not any, not any more important at the time. But it was consulted. You could go to the oracle and pay some certain sum of money in order to find out whether your grandmother would die or, or live. Uh, inscriptions show us these petty kind of things. Yes? How do you get to be an oracle? <laughs> How does that happen? I mean, <coughs> the, it, it, there's no oracle school, you're not the best pupil in oracle school. What, where, do, where do they come from? You're hearing this question from an economist. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be part of the Federal Reserve. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think we know. I don't think we know. Um, it has to do, the, the rise of Delphi it has a lot to do with the uniting of, of all the Greek cities and tribes into the nation of the Greeks. Because the Greek cities and tribes were notoriously uh, fighting each other and so on. So, Sometime in the 8th or 7th century, um, it was decided that the 
the act of fighting should be accompanied by periods of uh, peace. And this peace was guaranteed by four centuries, Olympia, Delphi, uh, Isthmia, and Nemea. And during the festivals of, of these centuries, one of which was an oracle century, maybe Delphi. There was peace, there was not a, no more were allowed. People could travel freely, visit Delphi or Isthmia or Olympia, which had, as we know, every four years. Um, and it was those four centuries that held Greece together as a nation, even though it was widely enmities and as soon as the festival was over and all the athletes had arrived home again, they took up weapons and shot each other again. Okay. Um, but these four places were elevated to the guarantees of Greek unity. Um, so the rise of all the concepts in uh, is a political question. How did, did they start? We don't have any records about this. Probably the, a, a, holy, a place that was considered to be holy, um, that such a holy place was, um, had some particular healing success or something that became famous then. All right. So, um, in the 1930s and 40s, a um, different kind of imperial ideology had taken uh, the reins of power in Germany, and a Lutheran pastor by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in um, more and more vocal opposition to this ideology, began to describe what he referred to as religionless Christianity. Religionless Christianity. And by this term, he captured the essence of Paul's proclamation in a very different imperial ideological context. And we will have the opportunity to explore that um, the, as we tour um, those sites. <coughs> but much of the work that has been done in making it possible for people like you and me to do this study and experience it and make these connections over time, much of this work has been fostered and made more well known by Helmut Kester. So we can thank him not only for the work he has done this evening in speaking with us, but let's also thank him for the work that he has contributed to um, the understanding of Christianity over a long period of time. Thanks, Tom. So um, uh, there are still goodies. Um, please stay as long as you wish. Well, don't stay as long as you wish. <laughs> we'll, we'll close. The lights are going to go off by midnight. So, um, but uh, there are still goodies. Please help yourself to refreshments. And uh, again, welcome to visitors who are here, too. Thank you. Say hi also to Gisela Kester. Gisela. So,